having played five sessions of Chaotic now, which is a substantial amount of play for a fairly uh, fast-paced and often action-oriented game. What do I see? Uh, what have I learned in particular? Uh, because the Williams games are full of uh, reflective slash teachable moments. And one thing I have learned uh, very, very clearly is that when you have this heavy, highly specific, NPC-rich textual setting, which in this case also very specific in terms of situation. First of all, having that specific situation helps a lot. So instead of this sprawling environment with a million fascinating characters and then saying, well, make up anybody, you know, figure out what they want and play. And you're kind of like, wow, that's that's going to either require a whole lot of pretty stupid finagling to figure out how we met uh, or it's going to, uh, you know, entail scruffing everybody and removing that option and saying, well, no, you don't get to make up whoever you want. You have to be here. Make up whoever you want here, which is actually a viable solution, but uh, requires effectively rewriting the presentation of the setting and tuning it into the processes of character creation to the extent that if you're not rewriting the game, you're, you're coming close. You're certainly rewriting the game, if not redesigning it when you do that. And I'm good at that, but it it's, can get wearing after a bit. You know, you're kind of like, look, you know, you, I didn't buy this game so that I would have to rewrite it for people to make it playable. So in this case, uh, the situation of play is both quite fraught and difficult and fixed. You know, you're, you're a jump team. You're going off to Xenos, you know, tough. And it's also in the context of this extremely, extremely detailed 2030 uh, as made up in the 1994. So what does this mean for play, though? What it means is that, first of all, like any detailed setting, I, when playing, really need to make it my own. And that means I'm going to bring sensibilities of mine to generate a hybrid science fiction setting, rather than simply saying, you know, oh, you know, conceivably, you know, he, email and say, well, what would this person do? Or, you know, what's it like over in North Dakota, or, you know, and stuff like that and getting that all like from the game author in some weird way. Um, instead, I bring my own sensibilities. And that also isn't just like stuff that isn't discussed in the text. It's about stuff that is. So for example, um, when I look at that setting, one thing that I see as just a glaring thing that I just cannot ignore um, is the fact that an enormous amount of the Earth's population died of a plague in the last decade or two, the last couple of decades of the game world history. Um, in, the, in the 2000s, in this setting, you know, uh, basically there was this horrific pandemic that just more than decimated. I mean, decimated means a tenth are gone, okay? No, this was brutal. The Earth's population was just shattered, just driven way down. So in science fiction terms, this is, in my, in my opinion, this is the most significant element of the setting and could not possibly but have affected culture to an unguessable extent. I mean, to just to, we've never been in the situation with this degree of Earth population, and then to imagine that degree of, of, of reduction of it is, you know, mind-shattering, if you are a biologist, for example. So, the fact is that after five sessions, I actually really haven't dealt with that very much, but for me right now, that is feeling like the biggest gap in my understanding and use of the material that they've provided. It's the part that's kind of hanging there saying, knock, knock, excuse me, but you've been dodging me this whole time. Um, you know, what's going on here? You know the history of the Black Plague, and this is far more significant than that. You're going to tell me that we're not seeing cultural effects that are at least equivalent to that? I mean, come on. So I'm, I'm kind of going, yeah, but you know, that's such a takeover 
So I've been kind of sticking a little closer to the things that they do emphasize in the text instead of just saying, oh, that happened. And I'm like, whoa, what? That happened? So what do we see with the things that I have messed with? There have been a couple. Uh, one is in regard to Xenos. Um, first of all, I have made up more characters than they provide, which seems to me only necessary. I mean, the characters that they provide are interacting with other people whenever they hop into a situation. They never say in the text that you're supposed to hop into one of the named characters. That would make things kind of easy, but I haven't done it. I've hopped into characters who are adjacent to them. And so that means making up characters. And some of them I've dealt with fairly fairly, you know, more in more detail, uh, their second host, the woman that they, they occupied. Um, I had a pretty good idea. You know, I, I had several streams of notes. One was, well, you know, what are all the elements in the situation? And one of those is her personality. Sooner or later, they're going to wake up a host and have the host there, you know, as a cricket. Um, it's just, it's tempting as a mechanic and it's also plot relevant. They're going to want to know things that this person knows. They're going to maybe have things they want to communicate. They've got to this person in specific, you know, either by hopping to them on Xenos itself or having managed to get to them initially. And the, maybe it's somebody that they want to communicate with, to make contact with. So for whatever reason, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a, a woken up host and, in this case, I, so I, I started saying, all right, for the characters who aren't listed in the book, I better start thinking about some priorities for each of them. You know, at least as much of a nice little chunk that they have for the, the characters in the book. So I did that for her. Um, they didn't get to see that. They didn't wake her up. So we didn't get to see that until she was in control of her own body again and they were present. So I was able to play her as a character. And so she had opinions, you know, she had you know, viewpoints and stuff. So there's that. And then we see a couple of other things. Uh, the, the fact that I took one of their major non-player characters, who is Prime Minister Krog, and I gave him a lover. And that lover happens to be the supervisor of that woman. So it's a, you know, I, I wanted to make anyone they hop into, I wanted to have adjacent to named characters. And in this case, I figured two adjacent is not where I wanted to go. I'm given their role, which was quite good, but it wasn't, awesome, which would have like put them like with Krog's secretary. Instead, I gave a couple of layers, just a couple of layers of separation from him. So there was her, Machal, and then there was her boss, Lida. And I said, okay, Lida is Krog's lover. What I'm doing basically is making Krog more interesting too, because right now he's just kind of, you know, Hitler Jr. in Xenos. And I'm saying, all right, well, maybe he is an evil son of a bitch, but let's see about, you know, his lover. What's her deal? And so I quickly nuanced up that whole situation and made for me, Krog and anyone around him, a lot more fun to play. Another consideration for Xenos is that, um, in particular, uh, I really am trying to say, all right, since the last jump team, how long has it been since they go back? And what could have been found out, what disruptions in the rather delicate power balances in Xenos may have occurred, or what useful information has some person of interest there acquired and would be acting upon, and this is how long they've had to do it. So I actually have been keeping a rather careful timeline of we play on Earth for a while, and then when and if they jump back to Xenos, I'm like, okay, so how much time has passed? Now, this brings me to another aspect of the setting material in the book that I have decided not to use. That's another aspect of dealing with this. Some of it you look at it and you're just like, oh, bollocks, you know, no. And one of the things that they did was to have Isabella Bain uh, fully aware of the jump teams, which is kind of, to me, you know, pretty hardcore. Um... Not only that, but they give her all this technology by which she can capture a jump team and prevent them from jumping back to Earth. She can separate jump team members and move them into different bodies. I mean, all sorts of stuff. I mean, she's basically a goddess. Um, and there are, you know, there's already, you know, rules and laws of you know, looking out for people who talk to themselves and stuff like that. So to me, it kind of takes away the fun of being a jump team and being able to infiltrate. And it also, frankly... 
um, given that she's got, you know, matter transmitters and can send thing, people to Earth and have them come back. I mean, she's got the drop <clears throat> at that point. Excuse me. <clears throat> given that she has matter transmitters and can send people to Earth and have them come back, she's got the drop on Earth. I mean, completely. I mean, she's, she's already won. There's, you look at the situation, you're like, oh, well, you know, that's it. There's nothing. The, the jump teams are going to be covering their ass and running from rock to rock. You know, and all the best I can do is to basically drop Timmy in their lap and give them a whole bunch of lucky breaks so that they can just kill Isabella. And that'll be the end of that. Um, and it's all canned. You know, it's all you know wrapped up in a bow. OK, here's what you do. Eh, that just bores the snot out of me. Um, I much prefer the idea of sticking with their canonical point that there has been one jump to Xenos. Um, and it's generated a couple of things. We have uh, this cyborg running around for, you know, convinced that there are all these ghosts or supernatural or otherworldly beings are coming and they killed his brother effectively by taking over his body and having him do stupid stuff. All of this is true. Um, I like that. But I also like the idea of it being a surprise that um isabella you know is not it it is now scared based on what she's learning is scared that this could be happening and it may not be sure that it's happening that the other members of the the xenos you know government or power structure um either would dismiss it or Isabella would be terrified of them finding out because that would call into question her utter control over the Xenos Earth connection. So I'm seeing it much more, you know, as, as a bunch of kind of disrupting elements have been thrown in by the jump teams. So therefore, uh, I'm letting this affect the situation. Uh, Lida and Krog had, you know, an assignation planned um, and the, the players, you know, occupying Machao were having her skulk after Lita to maybe like spy on them. Um, and then I got to thinking, all right, well, you know, Krog's at work. This is supposed to be like kind of a workplace, you know, nip around the back kind of situation. And given the things that the jump team had done, I was thinking, all right, how has that trickled over to his office? What's going on? And basically it just became immediately clear to me taking all that into consideration that there's no way that he was going to be able to keep the assignation. She was going to show up hot to trot and Krog's going to be like, not today. Things are busy. Their unknown shit has come up. We're, you know, we're busy and she's going to raise a stink and he's going to, okay. So I just played it from there. I had him take out the frustration on the poor, you know, the, the gator guard, poor guy. And so the, the characters get to watch, you know, a public sort of display of this, which neither of those two characters wanted. This is a secret affair. And so anyway, they didn't know all the details, but I was playing very much from a comfort zone of this is what's been happening over there in that building while you guys are over here in this building. And this is the fallout from that that you're watching. So all of that, you know, made a lot of sense to me to play. And I'm doing the same thing over in Earth and saying, while wow, they're off over in Xenos, how much time goes by. And then I have to say, all right, given all the things that I'm thinking of as the most active non-player characters, kind of using Champions Now logic there, given that time, you know, what, what's going to be in their face, basically, when they when they wake up? I mean, is, is it going to be, you know, the, the, the government of the Americas has taken over ICES and they wake up, you know, with the barrel of a guard's gun in their face? I mean, there's no idea. So I've been thinking a lot about those things and trying to stay loose with what it could be, especially not stay loose with what it could be, to actually be solid with what it could be. What matters is how much time. And I don't have control over that. If they stay on Xenos for a week of fictional time, they do. If they stay on Earth, you know, I've, I've been fairly strict about, okay, you're going back. But I've, as things progress, then the uh, situational demand on when and if they go back to Xenos becomes more flexible. So, therefore, um, I don't really know like how much time. So every single time there's a jump this way or that way, I have to say, all right, reset scenario is 
as follows because it's been a week. I mean, tons of stuff. I mean, I've got this, that, this, that, all these different situations going on, active characters, information having been transferred here or there. Um, I mean, God help us all when the false information that Margo, Mar Margaret accidentally delivers to Eon Enterprises, should she get the chance, I mean, God help us all when Eon Enterprises acts upon that false information that she misremembers. So all that kind of thing is in play. And I don't know how much time is going to go by when we see its effects. I have to be ready for that each time. It's a different and enjoyably interesting form of GMing. I've been talking a lot about bounce in uh, my ideas about role playing, and that is a beautiful example of an unusual or rather not very typical form of bounce. So lots to learn, as I say. <laughs>